Tonight, heavy fire. Israel claimed success at a recent sting operation that left dozens of Hamas militants dead. But Hamas continues to reaffirm that it was in fact civilians that were attacked. Fresh strikes. After days of no clear death in conflict, Russia attacks Kyiv with deadly blasts, rendering many dead and injured. India's Index Following a drop in ratings, Prime Minister Modi prepares to introduce India's own ratings index, with elections looming ever closer and credit ratings threatening to fluctuate. And making space. A clever cleaning bot prepares to head into Earth's orbit to do some well overdue junk removal. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you very much for taking the time to join us tonight on World News. We're nearing the end of yet another week, almost reaching the beginning of April. And with this fast-moving week came constant updates to key global events that we've kept you up to speed with so far. So as always, let's dive right in, starting with the Israel-Palestine conflict. Israel's military said it had killed dozens of gunmen and arrested scores more in a raid on Gaza's Asifa hospital. Hamas denied Israel's report and said those killed were all patients or displaced people sheltering there. Residents of Gaza City in the north described the most intense fighting for months around Ashifa. The raid, which began on Monday, sent Palestinians fleeing south. Israel faced fierce criticism last November when troops first raided the hospital. They uncovered tunnels they said had been used as command and control centers by Hamas. Ashifa, the Gaza Strip's biggest hospital before the war, is now one of the few even partly working in the north. It has also been housing displaced civilians. Hamas and medical staff deny that the hospital is used for military purposes or to shelter fighters. On Wednesday, Israeli forces released this video said to show weapons found at Ashifa. Not able to confirm the location or date. The military said it had sent in special forces supported by infantry and tanks, based on intelligence that the hospital was being used by gunmen. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken started a Middle East tour in Saudi Arabia on Wednesday to try to secure a ceasefire in Gaza, a strange show in Washington's relationship with its ally Israel. Meanwhile, on the conflict in Ukraine, we see yet more bloodshed as Russia launched a missile attack on the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, injuring at least 10 people and damaging residential buildings and industrial facilities. For more on this, we have other than the World News Special Correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. Minoli? Yes, Anuradi. An 11-year-old girl was among the two people taken to hospital, according to the city officials. Authorities said the first large attack in recent weeks targeted the city with both ballistic and cruise missiles. Mayor Vitaly Klitschko said missile debris hit several residential buildings, industrial sites and a kindergarten across the city. The Air Force commander said Ukraine's air defences shut down all 31 Russian missiles targeting the capital. Air raid alerts lasted nearly three hours. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a world news special correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. And with the attack, some light is shed on unwilling participants of the conflict. Foreign fighters who have been recruited by the Russian army have found themselves on the front lines in Ukraine. Some have been detained by the Ukrainian army. Kyiv is now in talks with their respective foreign governments to repatriate them. These prisoners of war come from Cuba, Somalia, Nepal, India and Sierra Leone. Their foreign mercenaries recruited by the Russian army now detained in Ukraine. They claim to have signed a contract that explicitly stated they will not be sent to fight. And yet they ended up on the front lines before being captured by Ukrainian forces. Russia is recruiting foreign mercenaries from countries with low wages and high unemployment to fight in the Ukraine war. Some of the recruits were drawn in by video posts on TikTok and YouTube, promising civilian jobs or working in logistics and field hospitals with a Russian visa and salary of 2,000 euros per month. 
This Indian recruitment agent is posting such offers from St. Petersburg. He explains that the contract would not involve fighting on the front. Your work would be, for example, to demolish abandoned buildings and retrieve useful stuff like abandoned weapons. It's more of a security and manual labor job. But what seemed like the ideal opportunity for these men living in poverty ended with tears and being detained in Kiev. The Ukrainian authorities say these men are expendable for the Russian army. The foreign mercenaries will face a Ukrainian court, but their release will depend on negotiations with their countries of origin. Kiev is in talks with India and Nepal to try and find repatriation solutions for the prisoners. And now back in Asia, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government has approached a major Indian think tank to develop a homegrown democracy ratings index that could help it counter recent downgrades in rankings issued by international groups that New Delhi fears could affect the country's credit rating. The Observer Research Foundation, also known as the ORF, which works closely with the Indian government on multiple initiatives, is preparing the ratings framework. The index is expected to hew more closely to New Delhi's narrative than Western-based rankings than Modi's team has criticised. Requesting anonymity, a top government official said that a review meeting was held by NITE Aayog in January and it was decided that ORF will be releasing democracy rankings in a few weeks. How soon though is unclear, including whether the index might be unveiled before the India's upcoming national elections. A second source familiar with the development said, that the democracy index being prepared by ORF went through a peer review process and expert analysis on the methodology as well. The index may not just help with credit ratings, but also on Modi's expected re-election. And on the subject of elections, losing Indonesian presidential candidate Anias Baswedan filed a legal case at the Constitutional Court to challenge the outcome of an election won overwhelmingly by Defence Minister Prabowo Subianto. The Anias team has complained about the widespread allocation of social assistance such as rice, fertilizer and cash handouts in key electoral areas which they said influenced the vote. The administration has rejected that. Anias and his team have also criticized the Constitutional Court's last-minute decision last year to change election rules which allowed the president's son to become Prabowo's running mate. Official results show Prabowo, who was tactically backed by the hugely popular incumbent president Joko Widodo, won almost 60% of the vote, followed by Anias with 25% and former Central Yava Governor Ganja Pranovo with 16%. Let's go for a short commercial break. Stay tuned for more key global updates. We'll be right back. And on the road to the White House tonight, former President Trump is a man on a mission to win back the White House in November. And he's made it clear that he doesn't have time for Republicans who are standing in his way. When Trump was asked about his former running mate and Vice President Mike Pence and whether Pence's decision not to endorse him against President Biden bothered him, he said, quote, I couldn't care less. We need patriots. Trump's opponents had a small pool of up-for-grabs voters to wife for even in the early stages of the race. While many Republican voters are entrenched in the Trump camp, the former president's challenge will now be winning over middle-of-the-road voters who are more skeptical of him. Meanwhile, independent Robert F. Kennedy Jr. said his pick for a running mate will come from outside the system as a poll showed he had the support of 15% of the registered voters. Kennedy Jr., part of the famed American political family, has shown some appeal among both Republican and Democrats unenthusiastic about another matchup between the incumbent president Joe Biden, a Democrat, and former President Donald Trump a Republican. It remains to be seen if swing voters really will do magic for Biden's campaign when there is more confidence in the Republican camp in rallying around Trump. And over in South Korea, junior doctors that engaged in collective action against government plans to expand medical school admissions quota are poised to face tangible consequences come next week. Starting next week, the government will begin suspending the licenses of trained doctors who have not returned to hospitals. Urging defiant doctors to return to their patients' sites, Second Vice Health Minister Pang min Su issued stern warnings on Thursday, stating they would face consequences otherwise. 
Starting next week, the government will enforce license suspensions for doctors who have defied the return to work order. Park also called on new interns who have so far failed to register at hospitals to do so by the end of this month, highlighting that this is necessary for them to advance to becoming residents next year. If the government proceeds with the suspensions, they will take place some five weeks after trainee doctors walked out of hospitals and mess, protesting the government's decision to increase medical school admission seats by 2,000 starting next year. The health ministry has issued prior suspension notices to about 5,000 trainee doctors who must submit their responses by next Monday. Following this, the ministry will proceed with issuing formal suspension notices. Thursday's announcement came a day after the Education Ministry announced details on how the additional 2,000 places and medical schools will be allocated. According to the current plan, most seats will be distributed to medical schools outside the capital area to better address the shortage of medical services in rural areas. The figure is 1,639 seats, approximately 82 percent of the total. Based on the announcement, its university will have its new quotas reflected in its admission announcements for the 2025 academic year, which will be released to students around May. Following the government's announcement, medical school professors, trainee doctors, medical students and medical associations convened on Wednesday night to strategize their response. The primary focus of the meeting was to discuss when professors from medical schools nationwide might submit their resignation letters. Professors from leading national universities have agreed to resign in mass. However, they have not yet settled on a specific date for taking that step. Professors from Seoul National University and Yonsei University have already marked March 25th as their resignation submission date, while professors at other universities including Ulsan National University and Songyunkwan University are still fine-tuning their plans. In the meantime, the government plans to host an open discussion on Thursday afternoon aimed at addressing concerns and improving the conditions of medical residents. And in Europe now, the farmer protests are still going strong. Polish farmers blocked roads with tractors in escalating protests against EU environmental regulations and cheap food imports from neighboring Ukraine, which the bloc provisionally agreed to prolong. Placards depicted a farmer swinging from a gallows next to wind farms and an EU emblazoned executioner with the words, Green Deal equals the death of Polish agriculture. For more on this, we have other data world news special correspondent Chatura Jainzer from Stockholm in Sweden. Chatura. Yes, I'm Radi. In Zagreb, east of Warsaw, tractors mounted with Polish flags lined the roads. The EU reached a provisional agreement to extend Ukrainian food producers tariff free access to its market until June 2025, albeit with new limits on grain imports. Polish protest leaders said they were not happy with the latest deal as it included the last few years as a reference for import limits. They weren't quotas based on the figures from well before the war in Ukraine began, when imports were much lower. Polish police said they knew of more than 580 protests planned with the estimated participation of 70,000 people. Back to you, Anrad. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Chatra Jayendra from Stockholm in Sweden. The World Meteorological Organization is sounding the red alarm tonight. Every major global climate record was broken last year and 2024 could be worse, with its chief voicing particular concern about ocean heat and shrinking sea ice. The year 2023 set new records for every single climate indicator. On Tuesday, the UN Weather Agency said in its annual State of the Global Climate report that last year, average temperatures hit their highest level in 174 years of record-keeping. They reached 1.45 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres Earth is issuing a distress call. The latest state of the global climate report shows a planet on the brink. According to the World Meteorological Organization, ocean temperatures reached their warmest in 65 years of data. And over 90% of the seas have experienced heatwave conditions this year. The climate crisis is the defining challenge that humanity faces. 
WMO Secretary General Celeste Saulo later told reporters that ocean heat was particularly concerning because it was almost irreversible. So once a change is established, it's, it would, I would say that it's almost irreversible in time scales that go from centennial to millennial time scales. So the trend is really very worrying. Tuesday's report showed a big plunge in Antarctic sea ice. It indicated a trend that, combined with ocean warming, which causes water to expand, has contributed to a more than doubling of the rate of sea level rise over the past decade, compared with the 1993-2002 period. Ocean heat in the North Atlantic reached temperatures an average 3 degrees Celsius above average in late 2023, the report said, affecting delicate marine ecosystems. Many fish species have fled north from this area, seeking cooler temperatures. The WMO says 2024 is likely to hit new heat records. The cost of climate action may seem high, but the cost of climate inaction is much higher. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We have an interesting update on space tech tonight. There might finally be an answer to cleaning up all that space junk orbiting Earth. UK startup Astroscale has demonstrated what it hopes will be a solution to the trash that's floating around in Earth's orbit. A robotic gripper that can grab old satellites and other space junk from orbit. This robotic arm could soon be going into space with an important mission to grab old satellites and other space debris floating around the Earth's orbit. Space debris is, is a big problem for all of us. The robot's been developed by orbital debris removal startup Astroscale, with a vision to create a safe and sustainable development of space. Since the start of the space age in 1957, we've had a throwaway culture in space. Astroscale UK Managing Director Nick Shave. We've put lots of objects in space, and we've basically not removed them, we've not recycled them or done anything else. So there's 10,000 tonnes of debris in space, you know, near 40,000 objects, all floating around in different orbits, and they are causing congestion in orbit, and there are collisions happening. And with no set norms for military space behaviour, some fear a potential space weapon attack that could generate far more debris. At stake are billions of dollars in assets, the orbital devices crucial to navigation and smartphone apps, text messaging, calls and internet connections that are used by industries and people globally. Governments and investors are seeking solutions and investing in ways to tackle the messy orbital environment. Tokyo-based Astroscale, with subsidiaries in the US and Britain, is one of them. The company is testing a device known as Active Debris Removal, or ADR. It's designed to latch onto defunct satellites and drag them towards Earth's atmosphere for a fiery disposal. But this isn't an easy task. Astroscale is looking at how to refuel satellites while they're still in space. Right now, when a satellite runs out of fuel, its mission is over. Shave says the company hopes to have an ADR craft in orbit within the next couple of years. We're looking at getting to orbit with this spacecraft towards the end of 2026 and into 2027. So that's the sort of time frame that we are looking at doing this type of uh, debris removal or refueling type technology. And finally tonight, we see a pair of legends appreciated for their work. Elton John and Bernie Taupin, the British singer and his English-American lyricist, were celebrated for their profound impact on music by the Library of Congress at the 2024 Gershwin Prize for Popular Song Ceremony held in Washington. Upon receiving the award, Elton John reflected on the joy of sharing success with Taupin and expressing his love for their journey together. Taupin, embracing his American life since 1970, reflected on his deep connection to the American songbook. In a star-studded concert, Elton John captivated the audience with performances of classics like Mona Lisa's and Mad Hatter's and Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting. One special performance had the previous year Gershwin Prize recipient singer Johnny Mitchell performing I'm Still Standing alongside Annie Lennox and Brandi Khalil 
highlighting the enduring legacy of Elton John and Bernie Taupin's music throughout generations of performers. I mean, with these countless hits like Rocket Man and my personal favorite, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, do they even need awards to prove their legendary status? Their songs speak for their greatness. Well, that's all the stories we have for you tonight. We'll see you again tomorrow with more updates on the happenings of the world. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good night.